<laughs> Hi. So after that introduction, um, I think I need to ask a question. How do you eat an elephant? Right. That speaks to how I approached Initiative 502, the marijuana legalization initiative here. Um, never in a million years when I went to work for the ACLU of Washington in April of 2006 did I imagine that I would become pot mama. But I, w I went into that work essentially coming from having spent over a decade representing people in local, state, and federal courts, walking them through our criminal justice system, seeing all of the collateral damage. And when Kathleen Taylor offered me the opportunity to come and change those laws and have an impact on those people, I couldn't resist. And then, of course, I sat down with her, much the same way that Anthony Romero got me to agree to end mass incarceration. And Kathleen said, oh, by the way, we're ending the war on drugs. So, <laughs> yes, we are, we are. I believe that. But I-502, for all that it was, for being the first time that a state legalized marijuana, for being the door that opened and allowed Eric Holder to say a year later that he would allow all states to experiment with their marijuana laws, that would then another year later allow Assistant Secretary William Browning to say that the international drug treaties are flexible enough to allow countries and states to legalize marijuana. It was still just a bite. We can do anything. So now, let's talk about mass incarceration. From 1925 to 1972, the combined state and federal prison rate, excluding jails, was fairly stable, fluctuating at about 110 per 100,000 people in our population. Since then, that number has quadrupled. When we add in local jails, we currently have more than 700 per 100,000 Americans behind bars. Those numbers are counting the children. It really breaks down to one in 100 adults is sitting behind bars in the land of the free. We represent 5% of the world's population, house 25% of its prisoners. So what happened? Did we suddenly become very bad people? There was, in fact, a significant increase in crime in the 1960s and 70s. And opponents of the civil rights movement and the Vietnam protests had a great deal of success linking crime to civil disobedience in the public's mind. The extent and the duration of the actual increase in crime, though, is subject to debate because, unfortunately, the collection of crime data to this day remains very challenging, and numbers are subject to personal inflation because we fund law enforcement agencies frequently on the basis of how many arrests they make. Moreover, crime rates began to fall in the early 1990s and are now at historic lows, back to 1960 levels. And criminologists agree that whatever deterrent effect the escalation in incarceration may have had ended at least by the end of the 90s. And at this point, we are probably incurring more costs in terms of criminogenic effects of putting people behind bars. Yet we have to look back even further than the 1960s and 70s to really understand what's happened to our country. We have to look back to the Great Migration between 1916 and 1970 when more than six million African Americans migrated from the rural South to the cities of the North in hopes of better paying jobs and new prosperity. Competition for employment and wealth fueled racial tensions some of which exploded into violence, like the 1921 race riot in the Greenwood and neighborhood of my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, which I did not learn about in high school, which I did not learn about until I'd already graduated from law school, by the way. Um, also the later 1942 Zoot Suit riots in Los Angeles and the 1943 race riot in Detroit. And at the same time that these race riots were happening, black veterans were returning home from World War II, home to the South, and being lynched. Race liberals were appalled that local law enforcement was not protecting black Americans. In December of 1946, Truman signed an executive order creating the Presidential Committee on Civil Rights. 
His idea was to call for law and order. He began enhancing local law enforcement agencies' enforcement powers with federal dollars and resources. And he framed the problem of black criminality, of these riots that were happening, of, of, of black crime happening in urban um, environments as a response to the fact that black Americans were being denied their civil rights. And if we would just grant them their civil rights and treat them as equal citizens, they wouldn't behave in this way. And that turned out to be a fatal flaw because then every time there was an incidence of black crime, that became an argument for proving that civil rights don't help. That expanded in the 1960s when Lyndon Johnson launched the Great Society and that happened to coincide with an increase in crime. And so that then became the argument that public investments in social programs that are intended to help people and lift them up out of poverty actually only breed moral and personal irresponsibility and more crime. And then President Reagan escalated the war on drugs. So we know that President Nixon declared the war on drugs in 1971. President Nixon had actually uh, created the first national treatment on demand program for heroin addicts during the heroin ap epidemic, but he really hated marijuana. Um, marijuana was a symbol of the Vietnam War protests. So he did his bit to start pumping up the war on drugs, but really it was Ronald Reagan coming in and tying drug use and street criminality and the crack epidemic that some would view as economic opportunity for blacks in Los Angeles who were losing their jobs as the cities industrialized and no one was investing in new jobs or infrastructure. But instead, it was again black criminality. Crack became the black drug. The escalation of the prison population during the war on drugs was incredible. You see from the, um, you saw from the uh, first slide how quickly the rates escalated during the 1980s. Drug offenders now comprise 20% of the state prison populations and 50% of the federal populations. The impacts of the escalating incarceration rates have been felt most acutely in the South. Even though white Americans use and sell drugs at slightly higher rates than people of color, African Americans are the ones most frequently arrested and most frequently jailed. Although African Americans represent only 13% of our population, they make up 30% of the arrests and 40% of the people behind bars. The rampant racially disparate criminalization of individuals now allows landlords, employers, bankers to discriminate against us, not on the basis of the color of our skin, because that would be illegal, but because we have a criminal conviction. Thus, the war on drugs truly is the new Jim Crow. How about some good news? We have agreement that we can stop being tough on crime and start being smart on crime. As Matt alluded, um, the ACLU has joined with Americans for Tax Reform, Center for American Progress, the Faith and Freedom Coalition, Freedom Works, the Leadership Conference Education Fund, Right on Crime. And this uh, coalition of unlikely bedfellows can agree that it is possible to incarcerate people less and still protect public safety. But how far does the agreement go? That's a question that we still have to answer. During the progressive era, white criminality in cities was viewed as being rooted in the strains of industrial capitalism and urbanism. And the response to white criminality was greater investment in education, social welfare, public infrastructures in those cities that had high concentration of European immigrants. Here in Seattle, the Seattle Police Department was sued a while back for racially disparate drug enforcement. And the numbers bore out. But during a deposition of one of the um, uh, captains of the department, 
he asked a question back to the person who was deposing him, which is against the rules, but sometimes we tolerate that. And he asked this question. He said, look, if this is true, if it's true that, it, that these are racially disparate arrests that we're making, if it's true that even some of our officers are doing it on purpose, what do we do about it? What's your answer to that? And out of that was born Seattle and King County's law enforcement assisted diversion. It's promising. One of the things most promising about it is the incredible experience of sitting in a room with police officers and caseworkers who are talking about people that should be criminal defendants by all rights and asking how they're doing, talking about the person as a person, giving them their dignity, demonstrating their care. As we move forward in figuring out what the first bite of the elephant should be. I feel strongly that as long as we're keeping respect for individual dignity and care for our communities, as long, at, along with an understanding and respect for the history that has put us where we are now, if we can keep those as our North Stars, we can do amazing things. And I'm reminded, I have to say, I have to stand with Howard Schultz in the arena. It's my favorite arena that Teddy Roosevelt talked about. It's when he says, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood. My personal truth has been, I've lived with a lot of criticism. I've fallen short a lot of times. I'm not always sensitive about the things I should be sensitive about, but I try. And when I put my hand out and I step into that arena and I get lots of blood on my face, I find that there are always people willing to reach back. There are always people that will go into the arena. So even as we grapple with the pain that this history has brought us and the challenges that we face in trying to figure out how to answer them. We want to be able to move forward in freedom. We want to be able to move forward in equality, but there is so much left behind that we have to deal with. I'm standing before you today to say I don't know the answers, but I'm damn sure that I know how to figure out how to get there, and I know how to ask you to come forward and do it with me, and we're going to do it one bite at a time, one bite at a time. Thank you.